Hello, my name is Lee Anthony. Welcome to my Biology 122 final presentation. Coral Reef Ecosystems, Biology, Ecology, and Conservation. Um, so, coral reefs, which occur between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude, which you can see on the map right there, um, the generally don't occur outside of that due to uh, water temperatures not dropping below 64 degrees within the within those uh, latitudes <coughs> and um, coral reefs are important to a large portion of life on earth um, it's widely held that um, coral reefs hold an estimated 25 percent of all marine species they sustain and preserve marine ecosystems. They provide coastal protection against storms. They yield habitat for commercial fisheries um, and provide economic benefits from recreational activities like diving and tourism. Um, let's see, coral reefs also hold possibilities for advancements in medicine uh, in treating variations of cancers such as leukemia, lung carcinoma, um, and especially the, the soft corals, uh, which several species have been targeted for study and whose DNA sequencing is being mapped in an attempt to replicate the specific secretions which um, seem to hold the key to these, uh, these treatments for the cancer. Um, it may be possible for researchers to use molecular homologies to identify additional species also um, which can may produce a similar substance uh, uh, one, um, so when you think of uh, corals people tend to think of uh, or when they think of reefs they typically think of uh, animals like sharks, crabs, coral, uh, you know, octopus, things of that, animals of that nature, but it actually, the diversity of life stretches a lot further than what you can see, down to the small cyanobacteria, um, which are responsible for a large amount of the life within a reef ecosystem. Um, so you, there's an example uh, uh, in the center of what they look like under a microscope. Uh, they provide nitrogen through nitrogen fixing uh, or fixation um, as well as being a food source for some other organisms within the reef ecosystem uh, they make up part of the bottom of the food web they also have a cyan uh, well cyanobacteria also have a symbiotic relationship with the zoanthella which are responsible for, for providing coral with the uh, you know, glucose, glycerol, amino acids, uh, and pigment, especially pigmentation, uh, while they also produce oxygen for the core, uh, well, for the ecosystem. Um, you can see the difference in, in having zoanthella in uh, the top right picture uh, in the before, where it's got some color, you know, it's a little purple, brown, and you see when the zoanthella is not present in the, in the, in the coral, that uh, it's it's basically white. It's called it's called coral bleaching. But uh, yeah, and the cyanobacteria. There's a, there's you know it's, you can see it in green, like in the top left corner, and there's a you know a red variation in the bottom left. You're showing a uh, you know there's a couple different species there as well. Um, <coughs> so the variety of zoanthella, um, which you which I pointed out in the top right there, is a uh, is as noticeable as the different amount of colors you can see that inhabit each coral type. So when they die in mass, it's you know as I said, it's known as coral bleaching. And um, this actually really jeopardizes what the the polyps that create the coral due to the elimination of those products which the zoanthella uh, produce. Um, So years of evolution and genetic mutations have led to a variety of genetic variation within coral species. Thus, as polyps, 
carbonates as seen here create their calcium carbonate shells each coral species has its own particular shape size and surprisingly some flexibility um, because the outer fleshy layers of a coral's body are actually transparent you can see the colorful zoanthella beneath them uh, which is where you know, which is you know obviously the where you can see uh, the difference in the bleaching when the bleaching happens this um, polyps can be colonial or solitary um, they can reproduce asexually or sexually depending on the species um, here we have a picture of broadcast spawning but uh, reproduction comes in several different types in asexual variants you see fragmentation which is the breaking off of a piece of coral only only to be moved and uh, uh, be reattached somewhere else and starting a, you know a new colony maybe and then you have polyp bailout um, where generally that's a lot of trauma and they they, they just the polyp will leave the colony um, due to like I don't know it's kind of impact with something um, maybe a boat or something of that nature uh, or part the rare bar parthenogenesis uh, like I said, fragmentation involves a piece of the parent colony becoming dislodged and coming into contact with like a, a viable surface that it confused with. Um, uh, the bailout, they just move to another area. But parthenogenesis is where an unfertilized egg can develop without without contact with sperm. Um, but that that is pretty pretty rare. Uh, sexual reproduction comes in two forms. So you have synchronized broadcast spawning, like we have here, uh, where sperm and eggs are released into the surrounding water at the same time. Uh, and then you have brooding, where fertilized eggs develop within the female polyp. Um, let me see if I can go back here. Uh, so within the female version of these polyps right here. So there's a wide variety. Um, That. All right. Uh, given that temperature cues can help regulate the broadcast spawning, um, you know, uh, and there's evidence within the Red Sea studies that suggests that some of that synchrony is lost in this, in several coral species in the region. That uh, there's significant and pretty alarming proof that global warming is uh threatening not only you know uh, the bodies of themselves the, the bodies of coral the colonies of coral but um they re even the reproduction cycles uh, are being being changed holy cow okay is yeah um oh my gosh okay uh, here we have some sponges. Um, they're located uh, throughout polar, temperate, and tropical habitats. Uh, they also make up a part of the structure of reefs uh, right alongside coral. Uh, sponges filter plankton from the water column and like coral they harbor, harbor hundreds if not you know, thousands of different plant and animal symbionts across the species. They, they influence uh, local seawater chemistry um, and even serve as food for larger fauna such as the hawksbill turtle. Sponges hold uh, medicinal use, the same as coral, um, in the research of anti-cancer, antiviral, and antibacterial properties. Uh, in addition to regional diversity, sponges can also be found at a variety of different depths ranging from shallow to deep sea. And one of the major threats facing these deep sea coral is deep sea mineral uh, mining. <laughs> and, uh, but coral reef ecosystems, like any other, thrive while in balance. Um, Part of the reef ecosystem includes starfish, like we see here, the crown of thorns, um, which uh, feed on coral. Uh, and again, like any other ecosystem, when 
it gets out of balance so over predation typically occurs which is currently the correct case in the great barrier reef off of australia um, however predators are also prey for larger species like this like you see in the upper right hand corner here with the giant triton snails which feed on crown of thorn starfish among other things and they have been there's a uh, they're being bred by a government funded project uh, in australia as a, as a control solution to this partic particular factor of uh, reef stagnation and decline other invasive species such as the lionfish have also become a great nuisance and detriment especially to the atlantic coral reef ecosystems as uh, as they prey on ecologically and economically important fish and crustaceans so they were never originally in the atlantic they were pacific fish only and for uh, there's you know people people had them as uh, pets in their aquariums and instead of just and, and they just got released into the into the Atlantic uh, just through uh, through people just releasing them um, from from being pet from you know pets in their homes to just out out where they're, they they wouldn't have normally been so they become a huge uh, huge problem um, with extremely limited natural predators because they're not you know originally from the Atlantic and uh, they've become one of the most hunted species in, on the planet in the name of ecological preservation um, with there's an annual tournament in Florida recently claiming over uh, or just this past just the past tournament claimed over 25,000 lionfish from just the, uh, Florida's waters coastal waters so that really didn't even put a dent in the population so it's just since they don't have any anything naturally feeding on them, or at least not in significant uh, numbers, that they just it, it's become a big problem. Um, so within the category of natural threats to reefs um, are large storms such as hurricanes and long low tides during days of low cloud coverage. Um, Hurricanes tend to physically break up coral through sheer wave energy, uh, scattering their fragments, though this may provide a chance for reproduction through the previously mentioned fragmentation, but that depends on the coral species. So long exposure to, to UV light during low tides dries out and overheats coral, uh, killing the tissue, but thankfully they tend, coral tends to re recover pretty quickly from, you know, uh, cyclical natural phenomenon like tidal changes it's pretty well adapted um, although U UV light itself is harmful to marine organisms it's uh, actually increasingly absorbed by the water as depth increases um, coral lives within the photic zone as you see here up to 200 meters um, but it's generally not seen greater than about 90 meters due to the symbiotic cyanobacteria relying on light for photosynthesis <laughs> so and there are some deep sponges and stuff but for the coral it's they you know about 90 90 to 100 meters within this photic zone so while these ecosystems are large they're fairly fragile as well pollution climate change and sedimentation and pathogens uh, and agricultural runoff have had a large impact on reefs around the world given all that they do for us um, as well as you know as humans as well as nature itself uh, we should hold the preservation of such a habitat structure as one to be safeguarded so while smothering by macroalgae and predation by snails and worms and fish or biotic threats to juvenile coral and well, all coral a abiotic threats that we as humans can help control are things like sedimentation, pollution, overfishing, carbon dioxide saturation, agricultural runoff, and deep sea mining, which are the, these things we are most responsible for. Sedimentation is often synonymous with dredging. It's a process of removing sediment from one area of a body of water and transporting it to be deposited in another location 
This is often done with uh, beach renewal. Um, and the problem is with that is the, um, it, well, beach renewal is one of them, but there's there's other things like navigation, flood control, um, environment. Well, I guess beach renewal might be environmental remediation. I'm not sure, but you can include that um, and construction. But uh, it it's it needs to be very carefully monitored and controlled. Even though we it needs to be done, uh, it's the fine silts that do not settle immediately once it's relo the sand is relocated. And it ends up smothering corals because they cannot self-clean fast enough to, uh, at a lot of times to, or some of the time, to keep up with the rate at which the silt accumulates. Um, so overfishing is another, another one we mentioned. And it's contributed to a, an imbalance, uh, re reducing populations of fish that feed on coral eating beard like uh, beard, bearded fireworms uh, and impacting other factors uh, affected by fish populations. So fish assist with nutrient cycling through excretions, so, you know, just their biomass, uh, which actually enhances coral growth, uh, similar to like fertilizer. Um, so when fish populations are redu greatly reduced, the amount of nutrients taken out of the um, ecosystem which feeds coral is directly proportional. Uh, herbivorous fish feed on the macroalgae, uh, which, uh, and I had a picture up um, of some of the algae in the cyanobacteria slide, but um, yeah, if it's, if, the, if, the, if it's left unchecked, it can smother the coral. Um, so destroying that symbiotic relationship. Um, so these species are often, the, the herbivore species of fish are often caught by in, indiscriminate fishing methods such as nets and traps which remove them from the ecosystem and uh, coral also provides a safe haven for small fish to hide which attracts larger fish, thus more biomass. Uh, fishing of species which group to spawn make them increasingly invulnerable to overfishing, uh, harvesting of excessive Large fish reduces the amount of young likely to survive to maturity, directly fish, affecting fish populations. And so when coral dies due to reduced like caretaker species, it in turn affects the whole system. Um, so you have, it's, a, it's another part of that balance. You, you need the fish to help really take care of the coral and the coral likewise in, in turn takes, takes care like the the small fry, the small fish, the fingerlings, um, the babies, so to speak. Uh, but when you remove one or the other, then that whole cycle breaks down. But overfishing has become a big, big issue. Um, uh, one of the other factors contributing to stagnant uh, or declining coral growth is climate change um, and it seems to be at the top of the list uh, as oceans absorb the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere it, it causes the waters to become increasingly acidic eroding reefs and making growth more difficult warming is also responsible for the massive coral bleaching that has taken place at times over the past several decades as temperatures reach critical limits the coral uh, expel their zoanthella and cut off, thus cutting off their own life support, causing permanent damage. Agriculture runoff containing fertilizer contributes to blue-green algal, algal blooms, which suffocate corals and reduce available light for cyanobacteria and zoanthella, leading to mortality. Watersheds across the, across the globe feeding the marine environments, killing organisms and making it impossible for them to survive. And estuaries. Where freshwater rivers meet the sea, there are large areas known as dead zones due to devastating effects. The runoff has had on those areas, killing and inhabiting, inhibiting marine life. Here we can see uh, the dissolve, the amount of um, carbon dioxide I mentioned, uh, which in turn lowers pH, increasing the acidity of the oceans. Uh, you can see examples of the, the measurements taken over the years. In particular location, just a few of the locations uh, that are monitored, uh, you can see represented here. 
so you can um, it's pretty significant um, but especially when it takes just a small change can throw something out of balance even if it looks small it's, it's not necessarily small in uh, perspective to the ecosystem which is affected uh, pollution especially plastic debris causes a great deal of disease among coral reefs the polypropylene that makes up a large percentage of plastic waste acts as a container ship for microbes uh, carrying and spreading disease to marine organisms throughout the world the fact that plastic waste makes up 80 percent of all marine pollution around 8 million tons per, per year sends an alarming message about the future of coral reefs especially combined with previously mentioned factors deep sea mining in an effort to bring more minerals to the market especially those utilizing green technologies is a potentially devastating threat for sponges that looms on the horizon currently the un is working on regulations surrounding the new industrial this a new industrial venture into exploiting seafloor resources um, and while it may help with global warming minimization the risk to losing access to yet unstudied and unknown sponges may be equally devastating to humans in lost research and knowledge, especially regarding uh, medicinal advancements. As coral reefs diminish in size uh, due to growing mortality rates uh, in affected animal populations of habit spe habitat species shrink, a bottleneck effect will inevitably begin to take effect. Genetic drift will cause alleles to be either over or underrepresented in any uh, uh, any given year sorry uh, the loss of genetic variation will directly influence the population's ability to adapt and change along with their environment and uh, here we see uh, in these slides we see the decrease of hard coral and uh, an increase in the amount of algae in the, over the world's coral reefs um, in, within these charts. So I'll just let you look at that for yourself. But uh, this bottleneck effect is is actually pretty significant and um, currently still a massive problem. But uh, diminishing reef so size also reduces the carrying capacity of, the of their habitat further shrinking the population sizes of all species, including those we depend on economically and as food. Population growth due to crowding will see a significant drop as individuals will not find the resources to sustain their own, own lives, much less reproduce. Um, that's all I have, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, watching the presentation.